phone resistance here also shows the angular momentum resistance that we can model. And if you think of a phone in simulation, like you, you know, you've seen these periodic boxes, um, you could just imagine piling this with periodic boxes and you could see this thing going through the two of these at a given time. So it looks like that. Then there were these error bars I was talking about, so that's sort of testing the existing paradigm. And then there's new physics. So there's a precision cosmology um, versus a sort of what you might sacrifice accuracy for this in a more wider, in a wider parameter space. And then for all of this, um, it, either in this parameter space or this parameter space, you need to be efficient in the, in the way that you compute how you go from these initial fluctuations to large scale fluctuations. And so I'll be talking about So generically, a prediction of inflation is that you get a so-called scale invariant power spectrum, a closed to scale invariant that's uh, shown here. If you have this, this uh, NS that we all know, uh, for, if, if it's one, then there's no dependence in the potential per law of K in two dimensions on wave number. Um, in terms of the density fluctuation,
think that there are some doubts we have to get rid of. So, very roughly speaking, this part, this is the feet of the uh, feet of Tego is like Tego the INS part. So the they, these are frustrations that uh, that entered the horizon after 9/11 and since then. Basically, they're pro probing the primordial frustration. There's not much. Frustrations, on the other hand, um, probe not just the primordial one, which is oral like that, but they go into the transfer function, where all this baryonic and dark matter can change the shape of it. And in particular, uh, I will highlight the uh, dark matter effect, uh, the way you can probe the nature of dark matter by looking at this small scale part of the spectrum. So, uh, but one point that, that I want to make here, and you'll see, is that. This, pro this part probes basically the early uh, sort of unprocessed power spectrum. Um, but this part also probes not just the microphysics that comes later, but also the primordial power spectrum. So the fluctuations are generated at all spectra. In fact, they're generated in principle all the way down to the semi spectrum. Which, and so this is a completely, uh, basically unprobed. So first, the dark matter. Here is, uh, for illustration, a uh, very nice simulation by Lovell et al. Uh, of, uh, of the formation of the Milky Way type halo. What's shown on the left is the standard TDM picture. What's shown on the right is what happens if you introduce a cutoff uh, associated with uh, at, uh, having a dark matter which is uh, not cold, and it's still allowed by the data. That's what the, it's constrained, but there's still a large small-scale structure, but this is uh, the fact that you can have all kinds of features in the inflaton changing the scale invariant and nature of the power spectrum has been around for a long time. And so um, I won't get to talk about it, but we're working on a project with Keshe and JD trying to sort of analytically model what the population of these sub are uh, for a wide range So first, uh, I'll talk about formation of the first stars. Uh, the current ideas are that these formed in mini halos with temperatures less than 10 to the fourth Kelvin at uh, high redshift. So this is a pre-Leonard diagram for uh, time equal zero to Leonard Kelvin here. Um, and the current thinking is that the first stars with zero metal composition formed uh, at early times, say between the ages of 20 and 50, in, in small halos. Somewhat large because we don't see zero composition stars now, so they can't be can't be grounded as the solar mass object. <coughs> um, and then, but why am I talking about this in terms of uh, supermassive black holes? Well, because there there was this work by uh, Voluntary and uh, Reese and Madow of um, roughly 10, 15 years. 
years ago where they said, well, the first supermassive black holes that we see at redshift six, um, ten to the nine solar masses, the uh, Sloan quasars, how did they form? This is this is the question that I'm talking about. And so the idea for a while was that, well, they said, well, you have these massive stars forming. So what if those massive stars form remnant black holes? And what if those remnant black holes then grow? back to this diagram, the spatial abundance we see of these, red, you know, basically redshift six to eight supermassive black holes is that is one per cubic gigaparsec, so it's very small. So what you actually have is 10 to the 12 solar, 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13 solar mass halos, so galactic scale halos, forming that redshift very high, six to eight. So that's extremely rare. So if you want to address this problem correctly, you need, you need a mechanism, you need a way to consistently with peaks, and so I'll talk a bit about uh, how you think about the peaks of the red sea field later. And finally, the third one that I'm very fond of is how reanimation happens. So these are current global constraints coming from the CMB uh, polarization on the optical depth, uh, which is equivalent, which we say happens all at once, to a reanimation redshift. This is this uh, mean. Here's a some work that uh, I did recently with uh, Christian Shoemaker and Nicola Shenke, um, where the idea is that you have not just those CMB constraints, but you also have uh, constraints from the absorption spectrum of quasars, which tell you that at uh, the end of reionization, so this is redshift from the three panels here, these are three different models, and this is the model that we put forward. Um, they tell you that at the end of reionization, that you had, this is the emissivity of, of ionizing photons, that it was rather low, that if you look at the Lyman alpha course, it's more opaque than you would think it was, because there's not that much UV from the end. And so this uh, so-called photon start end to reionization has been difficult to um, reconcile with this high tau that is reported. So one solution is that this could simply go down, which hopefully we'll find out soon, or that a reionization is more complicated. And so that was the idea we put forward here. Here is shown the reionization history that we find in our model. The, the new thing in this model is that we have two populations of, of uh, sources. So this is the star formation rate density as a function of redshift in the model. There are low mass sources. These are, are the things you would think of as the first dwarf galaxies, uh, things that might be fossils in the local group. Um, that you have these objects that are very low in mass, uh, relatively speaking, so low in mass that in the reionized universe, they would not form, which is the solution to the old Nissan satellite problem. So the idea is that they're small, they're irregular, so it's likely, like the LMC, that they would have a large escape fraction of ionizing radiation. But this population would soon uh, disappear be in, in the ionized and as the larger sources, which would be associated with Lyman break galaxies, more massive galaxies, uh, things like the Pavilions of the Milky Way, would um, take over and finish reionization. So you have uh, a low escape, a high escape fraction population that bursts, uh, on, you know, comes early, and then as reionization occurs, you lose those objects; they no longer form. 
This model by Hart and Madow used the star formation, their star formation was done previously. They have done a lot of work for James Bain. And uh, they said, well, how do you get a high tau um, in this model if you just take this known population of, of uh, galaxies? Well, what you do is you just crank up the escape fraction, which is shown as say the escape fraction is some value, it can't get greater than one, so once it hits one, it stays there, and we end up with sort of loving them more. But why would galaxies that are given luminosity, or given mass, have their escape fraction be so strong that redshift is not? So this gave a hint. So if you look at the average escape fraction in our model, it's naturally goes up similar to theirs, uh, but the reason it goes up is because you have this um, small population that has escape fraction. by the end of reionization, you have large bubbles forming with many thousands uh, in principle of galaxies inside of them. So there's a huge dynamic range, which is just a, a model developed by Solanetto et al., which shows um, as the distribution of the size of these bubbles as, as time goes along. And you see at early times the bubbles are small, so they have they're around one megaparsec, less than one megaparsec. As time goes on, some of uh, you know, questions that are interesting to me, obviously not all of the questions in cosmology, and so we'll move on to, again, just some of the data. So I have categorized them into three different uh, categories. Uh, this is uh, diffuse background radiation. So in this category, I put the CMB, primary and secondary anisotropy. Uh, anything outside of the uh, Milky Way has been simply called the secondary
and that it has a shape that is, uh, it's a distortion. It's a particular type of distortion that occurs when you have a thermal distribution of electrons that scatters um, the black body spectrum. And this is the so-called Y distortion. And so the fact that it has this shape allows you to be able to see energy in different uh, frequencies to separate it out. Then there's the kinetic effect. Showing here is for different reionization levels. It's not really important very much of what goes into these different models. These are some simulations, sorts of simulations shown here, radiative transfer simulations of ionization. And they show what kind of uh, sigma you get at L of around 3000 for the secondary anisotropy of the neutrino. And then they show what would happen, they plot this curve way down here, is what would happen if you had no passing rate, if you just had density fluctuation present and velocity, but you had no passing rate in the electron distribution. And so you see the difference between this and this is exactly corresponding to having all these bubbles. So then you see that understanding this KSV at the foreground, say, is, is uh, hinges on understanding how reionization happens and uh, trying to understand how reionization happens this is a, this observations are a very good uh, constraint on the passing rate of ionization. Where did the point source of sigma be from in the original spectrum? Oh, I'll show that I have a plot. So here, if you look at this, you might ask, well, this is an integrated effect. This is a 2D one. So how much power do you get from different redshift studies? So they made a very nice plot that showed this. So this right here is what we call the late time the amount of this power at L of 3000 that you get per co-moving distance. So if you integrate this curve over co-moving distance, over some version of redshift, you get the total amount of power that you see here. This curve here, the solid line and then this dashed line, this is this homogeneous reionization. So this is called the off-cycle dissonance effect. This is what you get when you just have basically linear fluctuations in density and velocity that are related. And, uh, and they, they give you, you would think it would transfer, but a second order you get this off cycle dissonance effect. <coughs> you introduce the passing you get this bump here. And this difference between this blue line and this dashed line is, is this difference. So I'll talk later about And then you have uh, galaxy cycle, the pressure, and that causes the spectral distortion. Can you tell me again? So if you yeah. What's the type of sample that you get in a passing ion cycle? So the, the, what determines whether it's passing ion is basically the clustering of the sources, the UV or X-ray sources, and the mean free path to, of the radiation that ionizes. So in, ca in cases where, say, it was all black holes, mean free path is long, and so you would get a smearing out of that passing rate, just because the ionization front is, is, is basically proportional to the mean free path distortion. And then in cases in which, but if you go back to the UV case, where the mean free path of the photons is small, you have these well-defined bubbles, 
But then if you make the sources much more rare, then the bubbles get bigger, they get fewer. And so that applies to the clustering, it also to the, the wavelength of the radiation that you're getting into the channel. So here is the um, point source we've mentioned down here. So here is, so okay, so this is data from FCC showing <coughs> in different channels the, um, the temperature Simulations by uh, McQuinn and also uh, Nick Natalia and Tim Sack give uh, slightly higher numbers. But that just shows you that it's quite modeled the same way Chemex. There's a lot of constraints out there. Uh, yeah, so we all know obviously. Well, I think that the uh, research has been fairly done in qualitative or quantitative. that this thermal one has the expressed parameter of like two point there's no thermal there's no the uh, there's no distortion there. And so because they have different that Y distortion is very particular in phase and things like the CID, the inflation star forming galaxy, can be a convolution of sort of milky black fuzzy dust over time. basically multi uh, you know combining these these two uh, sort of categories together so just to have just we're talking about the data we went from CMD now to to the radio and the time uh, this is something that uh, a lot of people here are involved in a lot of payload motivation for these sorts of methods and uh, can you tell me how this Thank you. 
brings us sort of Moore's law of simulation. So this is the Kafka approach. You just move Kafka and Kafka computers and make your box of chips. You make more particles in here and keep them in here. And here we have um, work done here that's quite competitive with the Q2 3M code that we're used with because we're developing. Um, this is a run that was done here at Pymex by JD, basically, using the code that they all set up. Um, so you're getting close to the, the dream of uh, you know, billions and trillions of particles in rather large boxes. Uh, it's not too fair because it just only shows the number. So if it's, if it's a really large box, it's almost linear. So, but this just gives you an idea. And then I wanted to uh, highlight JD's run a little bit more. Uh, used a, it used a Vision Q system and it used uh, almost all of it. His visualization I did that just shows this. When you just fill all the modes in the box, you get a lot of dynamic running. But you can only do one at a time. So the new approach, hopefully you can get through this because this is, this is basically the, the thing I wanted to show. So what is, in, in simulating cosmic structure, these are the three steps. You have to realize a pretend field of the initial fluctuation by choosing the k-modes from a random sample, so it's Gaussian in the phase phases. And then you, you do something to it, to that initial realization that forms nonlinear effects and body simulation, or as I'll talk about, heat transfers uh, codes. Um, and then with that nonlinear effects recognition, you make a simulated map survey or you analyze it, analyze the simulation itself and make predictions for things like a nonlinear model power flow. So this is your basic pipeline. So the new approach I'm talking about is not really changing its pipeline, but it's changing the way you do especially the first sequence. So what's the typical approach are these qubit boxes. Problems there are if you want to do the whole, if you want to get really long nodes, you have to make the box really big. Um, but say you wanted to do just a particular field of view, that's going to be difficult to do with these periodic blocks. You'd have to make a really large periodic box, or you'd have to make small ones and then pile them, and then get the long nodes and everything else out. So the new way that we're doing it is by looking at, is by creating these realizations of the modes and arbitrary volumes. And the way that you do this is you separate the, re the realization, that first step of realizing the fluctuation, you do the large-scale fluctuations, uh, and you try to sample those, large, this is a k-scale right here. Uh, so here are really large scales, and here's a sort of kind of micro sequence. So you, you sample the large-scale nodes uh, one way, and then you sample the small-scale nodes in the more traditional FST way, like a, as a uniform lattice of phase space. And by doing this, capture both the large scale nodes and the small scale nodes at the same time. And just as an illustration, so say you want to do a survey, say after those six qubits, you want to do a mock. And the sum you know, field is loop. So you need to make sure you get all the modes that could be along the line of sight or even transverse to the line of sight. So you have to sample really small k values. But then you want to make sure you capture, say, groups of galaxies. So then you want to do smaller group mapping, and that corresponds here to your resolution, which would be like the mass of one dark matter particle, which would be the smallest, uh, the highest k-mode, which you could find, and that would be in a micro sequence. So what we do, and th this was something that was done by Bond and Myers um, in the mid-90s in their careers, is to, is to tile boxes, okay, across the field of view, and to sample in those boxes fluctuations in this region here, but on the long wavelength nodes, every box sees the same small wave sample <coughs> over and over. And in this way, you're able to construct arbitrary volumes. And it's very flexible in the way that you choose how you do your basic mission. It's a memory of par parallelization because you can have all the processes to these, these large scale nodes, but you can have each individual process running in parallel to a different set of small scale nodes. And there's ways to improve this by making this not a cut in, not a sharp cut in case space, but a sharp cut in real space as it is. And uh, so that's one thing we're looking into. So now, let me get to the nonlinear structure. 
this is the, the solid curve of the best numerically calibrated what's called pink light on mass spectrum, which I showed you the press check with the little two more press check here is it's completely different. So and this was just running the algorithm. We implemented it in a different way, but the algorithm itself we didn't change, so it was pretty good. Finally, in the remaining So we want to 
So remember the big circle I was showing you? So this is an actual, so I didn't use the two classes for this, but the fast randomization stuff, you could just make a really big box. And it's just FFT. So what you could do is you could just make this big box and then you make, uh, oh, so this is you know the horizon and then we're at the center. This is showing the temperature of the IGN and we're at the center over there. Uh, only the temperature that comes from hydrogen What happens is when you when you when you when you first ionize the path of the IGM, it heats up to say around 20,000 Kelvin. Then it gets into photoionization equilibrium, and then it adiabatically expands, staying in equilibrium. So it loses energy to adiabatic expansion. So the regions that were actually ionized first are the coolest ones later. And so this shows this. So we're zooming in now to a uh, redshift of around 20, and these are these first uh, sources. So we're looking along. And as you go forward in time, you'll see um, a sort of complicated morphology of the IGN temperature arrive, where the centers of these bubbles are actually the coolest places. Um, and the, see the red there in the center? And so what this is meant to show is that as these reionization bubbles form, um, the IGN temperature, this is on very large scales, uh, retains memory. And so, even, so these are percolating H2 bubbles, and these are the initial regions that are still cold and are black. And once reionization is done and all these bubbles have percolated together, um, sorry, we're getting there. And then you see, but there's still these temperature fluctuations <laughs> in the IGM. And these are left over. So do you, you remember, <coughs> the IGM keeps a memory. So this is actually, this blue region here was actually ionized earlier. And so, this hasn't been looked at much in terms of the Lyman alpha scales, but if you were able to get really good statistics on the Lyman alpha scales, you might actually probe the, the fluctuations of temperature in the IGM because the Lyman alpha scales measure the temperature. Right now we just have global measurements of the temperature of the IGM as well as aerobatic. But you can imagine futuristically actually probing the, the uh, structure of the IGM. So the current Lyman alpha scales constraints just have kind of large aerobatic given redshift by combining many side lines to reach 6,000 Kelvin by looking at the, um, the width of the absorption line, of the Doppler line of the region. Yes, yeah. So you keep talking to the region, and it keeps you very fresh. And you also explain to me how you can time in the same region, so that that's exactly what it does. Okay. Um, and, and it does it in one shot. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like a tree in a vine. Yeah, I love the snapshot. Um, and then talk about the temperature of the region. Is that kind of a fun history of it? Can you do that sort of thing at the region as well? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because this formalism that produced this was using something simpler to interpret heat passages. And this was using a repeated block. So you could do it more efficient way. Uh, there was some work by uh, by Heat Trap and uh, Ren Zhang, the head of the Ren Institute, where they did hybrid simulation for two years, and it shows that you can time this very nicely. So how do you answer students who are trying to get into the yeah I talk to them about that brain of trying to find the perfect temperature to talk to them maybe about like other composers or other regions and like. Sources with different SEDs, say, that could that could produce temperature fluctuations. Oh yeah, but like the different ones you could ask, right? That's right. Like if you could say like this is the perfect temperature. That's right. So that's that's an additional. So in your heat passage approach, you would have source. You would have individual halos, mm -hmm. and you could say, okay, this one's a quasar. Mm -hmm. This one's a, a lyman. That is not in here. This is 
assumes everything has the same SUV. So that's that. And those fluctuations are expected to be at early times on the same orbit. As you go to later times, these fluctuations go away, and those fluctuations basically remain like as approximately the same. Like if you keep going at the same model, then it's dark? Yes, yes, it's just completely useless. So we have time for just uh, one more question, and then we can go over here. With the beam stop in principle, can you expand the domain to more than one structure, so like a triple beam or something? Yes, because uh, we're doing it without doing any domain. That's yeah. what we're trying to do. Yeah, with so the with tic-tac. Yeah, with tic-tac, the problem is you. it works because you find dense, like density peaks and that they don't move very much. So there's this very nice way of separating the nonlinear parts, which are these patches that collapse. And then as Dick was talking about, you know, first order versus second order perturbations where they move these nonlinear structures. But now if the whole thing collapses into, say, the Milky Way, and you have many orbits, then uh, we have to resort to phenomenological things the way we're doing on average. How do things work? How do they look like in nature? I don't know of any way of you know, straightforwardly using a curve to get some sort of highly random answer. So with the, the tic-tac, why would you do a lot of more less work? Because the sort of behavior of tic-tac is possible to study and that's worthwhile. But I don't think that really works in the short end. You don't really want to have to get into uh, emerging fields and then you want to see if the sky is like the typical sort of level for emerging fields. I mean, this can't do a full black dynamic of uh, orbits and how, you know, once you've got the tech data about moving it, the focus does on it is really the sky obstruction. So we don't really do that much anymore. But you could get a